Hi, I'm Edscar, and this is the M3A1 Stuart light tank that I built recently. I have two videos up on the model by Italeri and Warlord Games, the first where I built it to the second where I painted it, and I'll leave links to those in the description. But this kit, as I have mentioned several times now, is quite notorious for being difficult to build, not going together properly and looking ugly and misshapen once it is complete, especially in the tracks. But I disagree. I think the plastic of the kit goes together well enough, and you can see that mine looks just fine. And what I want to point at is the instructions for being difficult to follow. And in this video, I'll give you the correct information, almost as if this video is serving as a replacement for those instructions, if you will. I also want to show off the 3D printed M3 Satan parts that I designed for the kit to go with the second turret that the kit has but doesn't have a gun for. And really what that means is that some parts of this video will be very similar to my first Stuart video in that I'll be discussing the specific building of the kit and that might be less interesting and so feel free to skip ahead if you like. But let's get stuck in. Speaking in a very general way for model making, there are four pieces of advice that I follow whenever building model kits, and that are especially useful in this one. Number one, test fit or dry fit. This means just put the parts together without any glue or adhesive and see how they fit. And this means you can tell if they're the right way around, if you have to clean up mold lines to get them to fit properly, and that sort of thing. Secondly is to look at the instructions, although in this example the instructions suck, as mentioned. Uh, usually, most of the time, the instructions will help you work out just how the parts are supposed to fit. Thirdly, reference images. When the instructions fail you, look at pictures of either the real vehicle, or in the case of fictional vehicles, another model kit that someone else has built. This specifically helped me with some parts of this kit, like the rear hatches. Lastly, and most importantly, you don't have to build the kit exactly as the kit is supposed to be built, especially for fictional settings, but even for historical ones. There are so many variants and sub-variants of vehicles, field modifications, battle damage and repairs. If your headlights are in a different place, or your hatches are upside down, or you used a different aerial or none, there is no historical reason that that couldn't have happened. Or rather, as I prefer to say it, variety is truly more historically accurate than having every model look identical. So with all of that advice in mind, let's have a look at the building process and the instructions to see why this kit is so difficult to deal with. Starting at the start, page one of the instructions and we see there are five variants that the kit can supposedly build. These each have a small symbol associated with them that appear throughout the instructions, whenever there is an option in the kit and it shows which option goes with which variant. And this can be difficult to follow, especially for those looking at the instructions on Warlord's website as page one doesn't even appear here. Steps F are a good example. This here means that the M3 variant in Soviet service can have the machine guns fitted to these side armor panels, where the Desert Rats M3 has the riveted covers. Step Q later on shows the M3A1 with a round cover, but only for one side for the Tunisian United States variant. And just these being in different places and for different variants of the vehicle, and particularly as you don't necessarily have to follow these particular variants, this can be difficult to read. There's also these Desert Rat storage options that seem to imply that the air filters from step C are only for the Desert Rats, but actually no, they are for every variant of the tank. Let's talk about building the tracks. This is one of the biggest complaints with the kit and how difficult it is, because the instructions here are quite misleading and straight up incorrect. The first obvious issue is that part 14, the top of the tracks, is different for each side. However, both parts are marked as just part number 14 on both the sprue and in the instructions. 
The way to tell these apart is they both have missing track horns that go on the inside of the track assembly, and that's so that the extended mold of the return rollers fits. And once you know that, they're pretty easy to get the right way around. Once you have the drive sprocket fitted and the front part of the track, part 17, you can drive fit all of this and make sure that it all goes together. Another piece just below this, part number 15, caused me some anguish. The part has a slot at each end, and so it can easily be reversed. However, one of the track links is at a slight angle to fit around the drive sprocket, and so this really has to go in the correct way around. But that angle to that last link is so subtle that I didn't realise it for several minutes while test fitting, wondering why it wouldn't go together. For the most part, the back area of the tracks did go together easily once the front was in place, but I did shave down the tabs on part 16 to ensure that they went in without pushing up the other track pieces. At the point where you have all of the tracks together, I find it best to press inwards on all of the pieces at the same time to reduce the gaps in the tracks and in between the tracks and wheels. And this is why I like to use thicker polystyrene cement, as it takes longer to set and you have that kind of wiggle time. Another point I've seen some people struggle with is the hull armour panels. These have angled edges that stick outside of what would be intuitive, with angled surfaces that glue together with the next piece. The front piece is supposed to stick out like this, so that the second piece fits behind it. Equally, the third piece is supposed to stick out so that the last piece on the side fits behind that. Well, those are the specific difficult parts that I wanted to discuss, and so let's talk about some of the parts that I have designed to go with this kit. The reason why I started is because there are two turrets, the earlier M3 with the angled panels and the later M3A1 with the rounded panels. Even with two turrets, there is only one main gun, and that's because it's the same 37mm anti-tank gun that both types of turrets used. I wanted to build the M3A1 for my Yanks to use in bolt action, which means I ended up with the earlier M3 turret left over. And when I was looking up variants of the Stuart to decide how I wanted to build it, I came across the M3 Satan. Because nothing says flamethrower tank like calling it literally Satan. As I've been looking around for pictures, all of the Satan variants use the later rounded turret, which means my tank might be slightly historically inaccurate, but, you know, oh well, what a shame, it is the second kind of backup turret that I'm using, and the M3A1 is the one I wanted in the first place. But to make it work, I needed a design of the front panel of the turret, which is essentially just measuring up the original and making a functional duplicate. I then went ahead to make a functional duplicate of all of the 37mm gun parts, and this is for anyone who wants to field the M3 and M3A1 Stuarts just by swapping the turret. If I'm totally honest, some of my measurements are ever so slightly off, so if you do want to print these out yourself, you may have to do a little fine fitting and just glue the whole thing down solid. But if you can get the elevation to work, that would be pretty cool. But of course I wanted to make the Satan flamethrower replacing the anti-tank gun for my second turret. The plastic kit actually does have a hull flamethrower, which is a nice alternate version, having the ATM flamethrower in one. But I wanted the Satan, partly because I have that second turret, and partly just because it's got a silly name. The flamethrower, however, just glues straight onto the turret front, so there's no fitment to worry about there, beyond cleaning up the supports from the print. Now, as you probably saw during my painting video, I did paint up this alternate turret at the same time, with some of the Allied Star transfers and the same stippling black wash to match the hull. And so there is the M3 Satan complete, so that I can use both turrets for the two different versions of the tank, when I want a light anti-tank gun, or when I want a flamethrower. I have put the 3D models up for you to download. They are on Thingiverse and are free. I do have a PayPal link if you want to do a kind of pay what you want sort of thing, but because they're not a perfect fit, I don't feel like charging a set value seems appropriate in this case. There is one more factor that I can pull out of this kit, 
and that is all of the parts that I have pulled out of this kit. Because there are so many different variants that this kit is supposed to be able to build, there's all of these optional extra pieces. And of course I have a whole heap of armor panels, that's great, and all of those lovely rivets, but I'm also building a British platoon for bolt action, so some of the pieces are specifically interesting. There is a rack of British flimsy fuel cans, these rectangle cans that leak all the time. As I've not used this on the tank, I put this onto an objective marker that I built a little while ago. There are also the British smoke dischargers built from cut down Lee Enfields, and those will be handy. This is the Big Mouse, my Daimler armoured car, that got its name because it hunts big cats. It's a 1 to 100 scale 3D model that I scaled up to 1 to 56, and so a lot of the details are kind of simplistic, particularly those smoke dischargers. Well, a little bit of Dremel work and some paint, and I can take what was one of the weakest details of the armoured car and make it now one of the nicest. And so overall, the M3 Stewart kit from Italian Warlord Games isn't as bad as its reputation suggests. The instructions are quite poor, causing most of the issues, but I quite enjoy building it, as well as having all of these alternate parts and using the kit spares for other projects. I'm pretty glad I got one of these, and yes, I only had one even though I bought three, and that's because I swapped the others with friends for other tanks that have appeared or will appear on the channel eventually, I'm sure. Well, this video series has been fun, although it has also been a lot of work. I do like my little tank, my dorky little light tank, that can be used in my favourite game. If you managed to get through this video, thank you. Of course, there is the description box below with links to the build and painting videos, and a PayPal link if any of this helped you. The comment section is beyond that, so you can be used to ask any more questions or make any comments you might wish to add. I'm Edscar, always will be, and thank you very much for watching.